Good to see all of you. Glad that you're here with us. A few announcements I want to share with you uh, this morning. Uh, we have coming up this week uh, a few different things that you need to be aware of. On Friday, this upcoming Friday at 11 a.m., the Sisters in Spirit are going to be meeting uh, for their regular meeting in the Fellowship Hall. That's going to be at 11 a.m. on Friday. Uh, also, this upcoming Friday, this is for those of you who uh, agreed to be messengers elected by our church to represent our church at our local, state, and national uh, level. Um, the uh, annual meeting of the Baptist State Convention of Michigan is this Friday. Uh, it starts at 8.30 a.m. And so if you're a messenger elected by our church, please let us know. If you're going to be able to go to that, and those of you that are not messengers, which is most of you in this room, just be in prayer for us as we go and represent our church, that we would represent our church well. Also coming up this Saturday is the next men's breakfast. So this is for men of all ages are invited to come and join us. Uh, it's at 9 a.m. on Saturday morning. We normally have a very good time together, a good breakfast with one another. Please uh, join us for that. Invite your family, invite your friends, your neighbors to come with us. That's usually one of those things that for some reason, if men hear that we're going to be eating good food and they're already going to be awake, they can come uh, with us. So that's at 9 a.m. on Saturday morning. We are uh, wanting to honor all of our nursery workers. So we have uh, a nursery worker party, party that's coming up on Saturday, November the 9th at 6 p.m. That's going to be in the fellowship hall. So uh, we're so thankful for those of you uh, that serve in the nursery, which is literally tons of you um, that are here throughout uh, the year, whether you help during Sunday school or during the service or on Wednesday nights or Sunday nights. We want to give you an opportunity just to, to spend some time together and to celebrate uh, what uh, the way that you're able to serve and just offer a huge thank you uh, to you because there's so many people who would not be able to be in here and to worship the Lord without you serving them in that way. And so we're very thankful for that. So that's on the November the 9th at 6 p.m. Please RSVP. Let us know that you're going to be there by contacting Don Hadley. Her contact information is there in your bulletin. So if you didn't get a bulletin on your way in, make sure you grab one on your way out at the Welcome Center. And you can have that contact information there. Uh, we're looking for uh, people that would be willing to uh, serve as greeters. Now you're wondering, but Scott, you already have people that serve as greeters, they, they greet me when I walk in the building with a smile, sometimes a handshake, they hand me my bulletin and they're so glad. But we need more because uh, you may have not seen this before because you're already in your Sunday school class at this time, but it's actually fairly common that people will come and visit our church. Uh, they'll get here at 9 a.m. because they saw on the website that Sunday school started at 9 a.m. and they're interested. But they walk in one of these doors and you can always tell whenever they're new here because they're just wandering around and looking around because they don't know where to go. They don't know what to do. They don't know what classes are offered. And so they need someone to show them. And so what we have is an opportunity as a church to care for those who are visiting us, who are curious about our church, who knows what's brought them here uh, today. And so if you can help us Make our church a more welcoming place by greeting them at the door and asking them, what ages are your children? And then showing them what those, where those classes are. And then telling them about the classes that are available for them as adults. And then leading them there, showing them how to get there. And just being a welcoming face so that they feel uh, like they belong in this place. That's the kind of thing we're looking for. And so many of you I know are so warm and uh, so uh, good at that kind of thing, whether you think you are or not. And so we're looking for a rotation to be started for that, having greeters, not only during Sunday morning service, but also during the Sunday school hour. So if that's something that you'd like to help with, you can put that on your Connect card, drop it in one of the boxes on your way out. If you have other questions about our church, you can fill that out on the Connect card, ask your question. We'll contact you this week to let you know uh, about that. I do want to say thank you. Uh, to all of you uh, that helped with Trunk or Treat. So many of you donated candy or you served in other ways. You helped make gospel bracelets and decorate pumpkins in the back or you helped grill the hot dogs and serve the food to people or maybe you served drinks or um, many of you hosted trunks. 
yourselves. We're so thankful for all of that work that you put into that. Many of you were praying for that event. Uh, if you were here, you know, you saw how many people uh, came through uh, last night. Uh, the, the official count was 934 people uh, came to our trunk or treat last night. Yeah. <clears throat> We ordered, last year we ran out of hot dogs. We ordered 700 of them last year, so we got 800 this year. We ran out again this year. We did not run out of candy, but we came very close. Uh, we had just enough candy for all of our, our, all of our guests and kids to have. Uh, we made dozens of gospel bracelets with kids. They got to hear about the blood of Christ cleansing their sins and that they can put their faith in him. Uh, the Gideons were here. They passed out over 250 Bibles. And the only reason they stopped is because they ran out. And so we're very thankful for the opportunity that the Lord has given us to welcome our community here. Many of the people said that they come every year because it's the best one that they go to. And uh, they, we serve them food. We give them free things. We don't ask them to pay for any of that. But it's an opportunity for them to see our church family, to get to know you a little bit, for us to have the chance to welcome their children into our space and to just help them make themselves at home. And that's really what we want to do. We pray now, <clears throat> and this is your job, is now to pray that fruit would come from that ministry uh, that we've done. Uh, because we got a lot of contact information. They filled out their cards. They turned it into us because they want a $100 Meyer gift card. And some of you were like, what? I didn't know about that. But they filled out those cards. They turned them in. We got over 100 of those back. And we want to follow up with that information. And so please be in prayer. Uh, maybe some of you are here today because you were at Trunk or Treat last night. We're happy you're here with us. But pray that people would respond to that. I do think, <clears throat> looking at those cards, I glanced through them. I do think that there is a lesson for us to learn as a church. On that card, we wanted to know how people heard about our Trunk or Treat. Over half uh, of the people that came said that they heard about Trunk or Treat from their family or their friends. There's a lesson in that for us. Most of those people also marked on the cards that they don't go to church anywhere. And I just want to remind you that there are so many people in your life that you know, whether you work with them or you live next to them or you're on a team with them, whatever that might be, the only thing keeping them from coming here in the morning is an invitation that's not been given. You have an opportunity every single week to be the light of Christ all around you. And sometimes all it takes is an invitation to bring people here. I just want to encourage you to do that uh, this morning. Please be in prayer for our mission partner, Pastor Moses, serving in India with the work that he does there. But I'd like to begin our service now by reading from Psalm 23. And so many of you know this passage. As I read it this morning, I thought of a recent passage I had looked at in Mark chapter 6, the account of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And so I want to just read that briefly and then go to Psalm 23. It says, The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. There's so many people in our world today who are like sheep without a shepherd. And what this psalm reminds us is that we do have a shepherd. The chief shepherd has appeared and we can worship him because he has come and brought us into his flock. So think of that as I read this this morning. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. 
Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for being the compassionate shepherd. That you look out on a crowd of people lost in their sin. Desperate. For someone to look to, for something to look to that won't disappoint them like everything on this world will. But you look out upon them with compassion. Because you are the chief shepherd. You are the good shepherd. You care for us, Lord. You lead us as we need to where we need to go, to the things that we need. And Father, we're so thankful that you sent your son to this world that we might be reconciled to you. You did not send a conquering king to this world to, to smite all of his enemies. You sent a loving shepherd who graciously pursued each and every one of us that we might come into the fold and to enjoy his protection. Father, I ask that you would help us to rest in that protection today. That we would be reminded, despite of all the things going on in our life, whether it be family troubles or job situations or health issues that we're dealing with, remind us that we are part of your flock, that you care for us, that you will not leave us untended, that we can rest secure, not worried about the things of this world, about the troubles of this world. They will take care of themselves. But we can rest knowing that our shepherd is watching over us. So Lord, help us now to worship you as our shepherd. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we sing together, let's stand and greet one another in the Lord. Say hi to people around you. make your way back to your pew. We'll continue on with the song.
a soul to Him belong Who holds our days within His hand What comes apart from His command And what will keep us to the end The love of Christ in which we stand Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess, Christ our hope in life and death. The troubled soul. God is good. God is good. Where is His grace and goodness known? In our great Redeemer's blood, who holds our faith when fears arise, who stands above the stormy trial, who sends the waves that bring unto the shore the rock of Christ oh sing hallelujah our hope springs eternal oh sing hallelujah now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death was a test and you passed um, that song is on your hearts um, so um, well done I'm going to read from 2nd Corinthians chapter 1 uh, 3 through 11 blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of mercies and God of all comfort who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. 
For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer, so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the, through the prayers of many. Comfort is what this passage emphasizes to us. And the thing that brings comfort to you and to me is that upon which we can rely when all else fails. It's that which brings solace to our souls when we're afraid. Comfort to us when we're in pain. Hope to us whenever everything around us seems bleak and chaotic and out of order. And so, comfort is what we, what we so desperately need. That song we just sang is actually based off an old document that Christians have used for hundreds of years now called the Heidelberg Catechism. And the opening question of that, that document, it's a teaching tool, and the opening question is, what is your only comfort in life and in death? At the end of the day, what is it upon which you rely and lean? Answer, that I am not my own but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. We trust in God who raises the dead. So this morning, we have hope and we have comfort wherever we're coming from, whatever we're in. That's what this passage reminds us of. Let's address the God of comfort, our Father of mercies, this morning and draw comfort from his infinite resources because he is the source of all comfort. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, of all mercy, who comforts us in all of our sufferings and all of our afflictions of this life, that you, you comfort us um, in the good times, in the bad, in life, and in death, so that as we live this life, as we walk through the trials, the tribulations, the good and the bad, and the ugly in this life. We have our eyes fixed on Jesus. Heavenly Father, help us to draw comfort from you, comfort from one another, comfort from our brothers and sisters who have gone before us or who have experienced um, sufferings, that they can now uh, bear us up and come alongside us and, and strengthen us and encourage us and, and, and help us to keep going in the Christian life. Forgive us for our sins. Forgive us for being sinners. We know that sin still dwells within us and that even when we want to do right to our great discomfort, sin still dwells so close at hand. Please forgive us of this. Give us the comfort of the blood of Jesus that has taken our place. And help us this day as we even consider the fact that our own lives are mortal and perishing. That we would keep our eyes on God who raises the dead. And we pray that you would bless your people. Open our lips. Help us to sing your praise this morning and forevermore. For Jesus' sake alone we pray. Amen. All right, this time, children four and five, including you, young lady, can go to children's church. Let's stand together and uh, let's sing.
Good to see you here this morning. Glad that you are here today. If you want to take your Bible, if you've got it, turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. We will be at, looking at the end of Matthew chapter 6 this morning. If you've noticed, our readings today have been focusing on comfort and on peace. And that goes along with the topic this morning, because our topic this morning is no less relevant than any of the other topics that we've seen in the Sermon on the Mount uh, so far. They've all been very relevant to our lives still today. So Jesus wasn't preaching a sermon uh, just to some people during his time that only they really understood. No, it's very easy for us to see truths in this as well and to see how it's very relevant for us today. And that will continue for us this morning as we look at the topic of anxiety in chapter 6, verse 25 through 34. Now, when I say we're preaching on anxiety, that gives some of you anxiety already. It gives me anxiety to have to preach on anxiety. It's not a topic that I uh, enjoy to talk about, but it's what Jesus approaches this morning, and so we want to do our best to be honest and true to Scripture today. I do want you to answer these questions for me just in your head. I don't want you to raise your hand because that would stress you out. Uh, already. Um, but do you, do you think you're a warrior? Would you say you're somebody who has anxiety? And then you could answer this question. Do the people around you think that about you? Would that be something uh, common maybe that you would hear about you? The fact of the matter is, as I've been studying anxiety and we just see it in life, anxiety is on the rise. And in our country, it's a very serious problem that we face. Our country consistently ranks as one of the highest with the cases of anxiety disorders uh, throughout the whole world. Sadly, uh, what we've seen is over the last decade, it's become more and more prevalent with children. Uh, I saw one stat that said with our newest generation up of teenagers, something of over 50% would struggle with anxiety as kids. Uh, for females, it seems to be more of a struggle than it is with, with males, but we still see the problem on both sides with male and females. One of the things that is interesting to note, and I think it plays into what we'll be talking about this morning, wealthy countries struggle with anxiety much more than impoverished nations and countries, much more. There's such greater struggle. 
when wealth seems to be involved. And I think you would agree with me that the church is not immune to this. As I ask you those questions, I see you smile. I see you look at your spouse. And I see you guys nod your head because I think within the church, many of us would say that we struggle with anxiety, with fear, and with worry. I was looking up the definition just because I was curious. You know, we, this word anxiety can be thrown around. And I was wondering, what is anxiety? And so I was looking at the National Institute on Mental Health of this question of what is anxiety. And this is their answer. It's a, it's a little long, but just bear with me if you will. It says occasional anxiety is a normal part of life. Many people worry about things such as health, money, or family problems. But anxiety disorders involve more than temporary worry or fear. For people with an anxiety disorder, the anxiety does not go away and can get worse over time. The symptoms can interfere with daily activities such as job performance, schoolwork, and relationships. There are several types of anxiety disorders, including generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, social anxiety disorder, and various phobia-related disorders. Here's the definition of general anxiety disorder. It usually involves a persistent feeling of anxiety or dread, which can interfere with daily life. It's not the same as occasionally worrying about things or experiencing anxiety due to stressful life events. People living with general anxiety disorder experience frequent anxiety for months, if not years. Here are some symptoms. Feeling restless, wound up or on edge, being easily fatigued, having difficulty concentrating, being irritable, having headaches, muscle aches, stomach aches, or unexplained pains, difficulty controlling feelings of worry, having sleep problems such as difficulty falling or staying asleep. Now, when I read this definition, I thought, I think I have generalized anxiety disorder. <laughs> I don't know if you feel the same as I read this definition. I don't think it's the best definition. I think they're doing their best to try to describe this, but it shows the complexity, I think, of anxiety, fear, and worry. What is occasional fear? Once a week? Twice a week? Three times a week? Seven days a week? Just not all day? What, what does that mean? What, is, what does good sleep mean? Right? What does feeling fatigued mean? I'm fatigued already. It's not even noon. You probably feel the same. Right? I'm not trying to make light of anxiety. I'm just saying when I look at this definition, I would start to think, who wouldn't say that this doesn't describe them? You see, when you look at Scripture, anxiety is one of the most discussed topics in all of Scripture. Consistently throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, we are commanded to fear not. Fear not. Fear not. It happens all the time in Scripture. You can go back and read it and look at it for yourself. It is all over the place. And God knows that this is a struggle that we have. That there's going to be fear, there's going to be worry, there's going to be anxiety. And his answer to that is to tell us, Fear not. Fear not. God does not want us to live a life of anxiety, of worry, and of stress. And so this morning as we approach this passage that we have in front of us, I want to approach it in a way that is honest. Honest to yourself, to be open about your tendencies to worry, to fret, to have fear, but then also open to what is Jesus actually telling us here in this passage of how to, to deal with this. Now, I do want to make note, anxiety, fear, worry plays out differently in all of our lives. We all react differently to situations. And I'm sure you've seen it within your family. You know, I have seen it as well. You know, there are people who can be calm and collected during times of stress. There are some people who just want to sleep during times of stress, right? They just kind of disappear. There are some people who you think they have been lit on fire because they run around like crazy when things are happening. Like there's all different ways to respond, and we do need to make note of that. And so for some of us this morning, though, I think as we look at this topic, I think we have to be honest to say some of our anxiety is sin-based. It is sin-based. And we need to confess that to the Lord. Now, I do know that this can be a serious medical issue, and I don't want to push that down, and I, I, I don't want to negate that. But I do think we can look inside and see that some of it definitely is going to be because of sin in our life. And so I do think Jesus has a word for all of us this morning. So look at verse 25 of chapter 6. We'll read to the end of the chapter. 
He says, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, being, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O you of little faith, therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. The question that I wrote uh, for my first point here is the question, what is life about? And I see this in verse 25 and also verses 31 through 32. You see, we're given a command right away in this passage to not worry and we're told to not worry about a couple things, what we eat and what we wear. For those listening to Jesus during this time, both of these would have been vital things in their life. Many of the people listening to Christ would have lived day to day. Uh, their food would have been a day to day thing. Uh, the things that they need to take care of themselves would have been a day to day thing. In fact, clothing, it might seem weird that Jesus talks about clothing here, but Clothing was kind of seen as a, a sort of caste system of the day. The wealthy had very nice clothes. They would actually hand it over as an inheritance to their children, uh, nice clothes. And so you could kind of tell where you fit in society uh, based off of your clothes. And so some people would go out of their way to spend a lot of their money on clothes so that they would look good, <laughs> so that they would look better than they really were uh, in a financial way for people. For many of us today, these are not worries of ours. Food and clothing. The, the problem you probably had this morning with clothing wasn't, am I going to have to go to church naked? The problem was, what am I going to wear? Is the church going to be cold? Yes, it's a little cold this morning, right? Uh, or what, all these different things, right? How am I going to feel? What Does this match? What does this look like? Oh, I think I've gained a little weight. That was your worry as you put on your clothes this morning. Not necessarily, will I have clothes? Same with food. You're probably not worrying right now, will I eat lunch today? What you're worrying about is, where will I eat lunch? What am I going to eat? Is it going to taste good? All these different questions. This, these are the things that we would tend uh, to worry about. And it's because of these worries that we have of, do these clothes look nice, right? Am, am I going to actually enjoy the food that we then start to worry? Am I going to make enough money to keep up the image that I want to have? So maybe some of you this morning, when you looked at your clothes, you just thought, you know, these are, these are junk. This whole closet is junk. I, I need new shoes. I need a new belt. I, I need this. I need that. And that can start to cause some stress in our life, isn't it? Because I, I need to make the money to be able to afford these different things. This is why our anxiety in nations that have wealth seem to be so much worse than those who just wonder if they're going to eat or have something to drink uh, that day. We run this race of keeping up with the each other. But yet Jesus here clearly states, we cannot deny what Jesus says here. He says it very bluntly, do not worry. And the question that I would ask back to Jesus is, how in the world can you say that to me? These things are a big deal. If I eat is important. And not just if I eat, but I'm a dad and I'm married to a wife and they need to eat. And the Bible tells me that I need to take care of them and make sure they can eat. How can you tell me not to worry and stress out about these things? Because these things are a big deal. Yet, this is exactly what Jesus says. Do not worry about what you will eat or the clothes that you are going to wear. This is what he says right off the bat. And as we get down to verses 31 and 32, this is why I'm kind of jumping around. He tells us why not to worry about them. He says, this is what the Gentiles seek after. That you are to be different. As a believer, you are to be different than the Gentiles. And these are the things that the Gentiles find to be important. Another reason that Jesus tells us to not worry is it's pretty healthy to not worry, isn't it? Oh, we feel a lot better when we're not stressed, when we don't have anxiety. 
But as we read verses 31 and 32, we also see that it's for the sake of the gospel. Because he says, we don't worry about what we shall drink or what we shall wear. For the Gentiles seek after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. We are not the Gentiles. As Christians, we have been saved by the blood of Christ. And so we live differently than the rest of the world. And why do we do that? We do that because as Christians, we have the truth. We know what life is about. We know who is in control of all things, right? We, we know these things. And so because of that, it leads to a different way of living. That's how it's going to play out. We're going to live differently. And as we live differently, what happens? Well, it should be noticed. As we live in a different way, it's noticed by others. And as they notice this, eventually they start to wonder, why are they living so differently? Now, some people just start to say, well, it's just because they're weird or whatever the case might be. But some start to ask, you don't seem so stressed as everybody else. You don't seem to be worried about the election and what's going on. Why, why is this? What, what's so different in your life? And it gives you an opportunity to share the gospel with them and hope that God will use that in their life, maybe to save them by God's grace. But if we're running around just like the Gentiles worried about everything all the time, I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. I don't know how I'm going to get this rent out. I don't know how we're going to get from here to there. And you, we're just constantly stressed and aggravated. We look like, just like everybody else. There's no difference. And Jesus is saying, this is how the Gentiles live, but this is not how we are to live. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, we already went through this. But Jesus in this sermon already, he said, In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Here our good works would be, do not worry. I think the truth is we cannot worry and go after the same things that those who have no Savior. Because we have a Savior. People who do not have a Savior have goals. And they should be very different from those of us who do have a Savior. We have a different goal. And you can think about it as how Paul would label it. We are running a race. Those who have not trusted in Christ, they are running a race towards a goal. It's not our goal anymore. When God saves us, we're now a part of a race with a very different goal. Right? And so we are running that race. And it's, it's different. And it should be noticed. Well, Jesus goes on in verses 26 through 29, and he, he talks to us about the trouble of anxiousness. <clears throat> in verse 26, we see Jesus says, Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Jesus reminds us in verse 26 that God cares for his children. God loves his children. He, Jesus uses an argument of the lesser to the greater here. He says, and maybe, maybe they're flying around, right? He's like, look at, look at those birds. Do they seem stressed out? Look at those birds. They just live their life in a way that they're flying around and they land on the ground and like, oh, there's a worm. I'm going to eat the worm. There's a bush with some fruit on it. I'm going to peck at the fruit. The, their life is completely handled. There's, there's no struggle. It doesn't seem there's no toil. They just... Simply care. And the way Jesus kind of says is like they, they eat the worm and they're just like, thank you, God, for the worm today. Or, thank you for this. There doesn't seem to be this, this stress. This is how the, how the birds live. And so the, you, you can picture the people kind of sitting there looking at the birds and thinking, oh, yeah, yeah, that's kind of true. And then Jesus asks them the question, do you not think you're of more value than the birds? Now, for some of us today, sadly, there are people who would say, I think humans and birds are of the same value. That's not true. You might think that way. That is not true. We're not all made the same. We as humans are made in the image of God. We are much different than everybody, all the other animals in the world. And Jesus is saying, don't you think you're of more value than these birds who are flying in the air? Again, the obvious answer is supposed to be, of course we are. And so we're reminded as Jesus talks about this, that God loves his children. God is so kind to the world that he provides grace to everybody, even those who are not his children. The sun comes up on his children just like it comes up on those who aren't his children. God is very kind. He provides water and food, all these different things for Christians and non-Christians alike. Yes, that is true. But 
for his children, he provides something very special. Christ. And in Jesus, you are his. And the Bible tells us that God has adopted you into his family through the blood of Christ and that you are given an inheritance. I read it at the end of the service last week. Ephesians chapter 1 talks about that. You're his child and you are you're given an inheritance that cannot be taken away. The Bible also tells us that as children of God, Hebrews chapter 12, he disciplines us. He cares for us enough that he doesn't just say, all right, just go. No, he disciplines us, trains us and helps us, warns us and takes care of us. These are good things that God does for his children. And here, Jesus tells us that God loves us. And he knows what you need. And that he will take care of you as his child. I think about my family and my life. I guess I'm kind of speaking for my kids here. I don't know if they've ever truly wondered, are my parents going to feed me this week? Now, at the hospital, if you've ever taken your kids to the doctor recently, they ask them the questions. It's kind of awkward. Have you felt threatened? Have you felt like you weren't going to get food? Have you felt in danger? Right? They've asked all these different questions to them. And thankfully, my kids have always answered, no, no problems. But I'm in the room, so maybe they have felt they needed to do that at the time. But I would hope that my kids have never wondered, do you think mom and dad will give us food this week? Now, why would they not worry about that? Because mom and dad love them. Because mom and dad care about them. Because mom and dad would probably let them eat before mom and dad if food was getting difficult to buy and to purchase. And now if me, a sinner, can love my children in that way, how much more can God the Father love me? He's perfect. And Jesus is saying, he loves you and he will take care of you. Your mind maybe goes back a little bit to uh, when God freed Israel from Egypt. And you remember Israel, they didn't have any water. And what did, what did God do? See that rock over there? Just hit it, water will come out. To us, that seems like a big deal. To God, that's not a big deal to make water come from a rock. Are you kidding me? This is, this is a piece of cake. This is nothing. When the people were hungry and they wanted food, what did God do? You know the dew that lays on the grass? The dew that's annoying on your car in the morning that's starting to freeze a little bit? That'll, that'll become food when you wake up. There you go. There's your food. To us, that's a big deal. You mean dew is going to turn into food? To God, Nothing. Why? Because those were his children. And they needed to be took care of. And he took care of them. And we should look at that story and we should be reminded that God loves us and he takes care of us. Well, Jesus goes on and he teaches us in verse 27 what worry gets us. And which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life? There is no productivity happening in worrying. None whatsoever. And this is some of our struggle with worrying and anxiety. It causes us to freeze, doesn't it? It causes us to freeze. We don't move. We don't know what to do. We're so scared to make the wrong decision or to do the wrong thing that we just say, you know what, I just will not do anything. Jesus is pointing out here that worrying is unproductive. Can you add an hour to your life by worrying? Well, again, there's an obvious answer here. No. You can't even add a single hour to your life then who do you think you are? What are you worrying about? It really shows of our lack of control of ourselves and our ability to get through this life. That it's God who takes care. It's God who gives us time. It's God who provides for you food. It's God who provides for you money. It's God who does all of this for you. And he does it because he loves you. Yes, you go to work. Why do you have a job? God. That's why you have a job. Yes, you go and you exercise and you try to be healthy. Why do you have breath? God, it could all be over. It could all be over. God allows all of that to happen. He allows your blood to flow. He lets your heart pump. He lets your brain think. God does all of that. You can't even add an hour to your own life. Now, we're going to try to do that next week because time changes. We fall back. Just know that. But you can't do that. We can't do that. And so Jesus is pointing out here, your worrying is, it's unproductive. It's not, it's not doing any good for you. As we get down to verses 28 through 29, we see what, le what causes this worry. 
is a lack of faith. Jesus gives another argument of lesser to greater. He says, look at the lilies of the field. And maybe at the time they were blooming, right? And he's, they're looking at the flowers and this huge field of flowers and the beauty of it. And we know what that looks like where we live. In the springtime when things start to come up and as we get into summer and the fields around here, it really is a beautiful sight. Or to see the winter wheat go from green to golden. It's a beautiful thing to really see all these fields like that. We have all of this beauty. We have, we have God taking care of, of all of these things. And he says, look at all those lilies. Not even Solomon was took care of like God is taking care of those lilies. Solomon was known for his wardrobe. The writer Josephus actually wrote about it. That Solomon took great care in the things he wore. And he had a huge war, wardrobe. And he made sure everything was very expensive that he wore. And so people knew about it. So there's a reason why Jesus pinpointed Solomon here. He said, not even Solomon is dressed as nice as these lilies in this field. A, a simple flower. A simple flower. And what does Jesus say ends up with it? Thrown for fuel. Thrown into fire. This thing that it's going to nothing. It's just going to be thrown away. It's just going to be burnt. But yet God takes care of it with such great detail that not even Solomon's taken care of that well. You think for a second that God doesn't care about you if he cares about those lilies in the field? Yes, of course he does. And what does Jesus attribute this worry about? A lack of faith is what he says there in our passage. Right? He says, uh, and why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God, clothes, God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown to the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little Faith? Lack of faith. Well, lack of faith in what? Or how does this lack of faith come about? Well, living with anxiety shows us a lack of faith in who God is. And this is where I think we need to be honest with ourselves about our anxiety and our worry and our struggles and where it stems from. Because anxiety and worry and struggles really shows that we lack faith in who God is and who he tells us he is. Number one, I think you would agree with me that the Bible teaches us that God knows all things. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. Yet too often we act as if God doesn't know what he's doing. Uh, right? The, our anxiety and our fears come from the future. What's going to happen? What's going to take place? As if God doesn't know. It's a very fitting time for this sermon. Uh, we're supposed to vote soon. Uh, two weeks, I think. Right? Some of you could vote early. There are some of you absolutely scared to death about what's going to happen. What is it? November 5th, I think? Is it the 5th? November 5th. Tuesday, November 5th. You are scared to death of what's going to happen. There's a sense in that, if you're honest with yourself, where we start to question God, what's going on? Do you really know and understand what's happening here in our great country? You see, this is where sin starts to creep in. Where Satan starts to deceive us. Or maybe your anxiety is from maybe you're wondering if God will intervene. You're questioning his power. The Bible does tell us that God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He can do anything. He can make water come from a rock. He can make dew turn into manna. But we start to question, but can you get me money to pay my water bill? Can you actually provide food for me and my family? Do, do you even know how to do this? I think this is where some of our fear and anxiety really does stem from. We live our life in a way that we act as if God has no power to overcome our circumstances. The doctor is saying this. My boss is saying this. I don't know if God actually can do anything about this. And then the third thing is something we already talked about. We live as if God doesn't love us. But the Bible tells us over and over again that God loves his children. But you question at times in your life, you think, does he really love me? Why would I be going through this if he loved me? Why would I be facing difficulty and hard times and difficult circumstances if God really loved me. 
Yet the truth is, the Bible tells us over and over again, God loves you. He loves you so much he would send Jesus to die for you. The truth is, you and I have to be willing to fight our anxiety. We have to be willing to fight it, and we have to do it according to the Word of God, how He has, how he has called us to do it. I think, I think too often what we do is we, we run to other avenues for our anxiety. Yes, sometimes medicine is needed. I agree with that. I have that in my own household. I'm not doubting that. I'm not saying you're a sinner if you go to the doctor for anxiety. There are some of you, I would take you there. I'll drive you if you want to go there. I'll gladly do it. So that's not, that's not what I'm saying. Don't, don't think that, please. But it is something that we have, to, we have to fight. Another thing I looked up, this comes from the, uh, from the Mayo Clinic health system. They have 11 tips for coping with anxiety. Number one, avoid alcohol and drugs. Okay. Two, eat healthy. Three, identify triggers. Uh, keep physically active. Learn about your disorder. Make sleep a priority. Quit smoking and reduce or quit drinking caffeinated drinks. Socialize with people. Stick to your treatment plan. Use stress management and relaxation techniques. Write in a journal. Now, I'm not going to disagree with any of those things. I think if we all did all those things, we would all be better off. Life would be better off. But here's the problem with their list. Their list doesn't actually deal with the source of anxiety, which is sin and corruption in this world which is the battle that everybody continues to rage and rage and reign throughout history, even though Christ has conquered it for them. We try to do it apart from the word of God, and it will not work. It will not work. The Bible teaches us that the only people who can fear not, the only people who cannot worry, are children of God. That's it. That's it. And so we have to do this according to Scripture. And we say, well, how do we do that? Well, if we follow Jesus' sermon so far, and the Sermon on the Mount, what he is telling us as we flow through the thought process here of, of Christ is anxiety comes from a self-centered focus instead of a focus on the kingdom of God. You see, that's what this sermon's been about so far. The kingdom of God. The Beatitudes. This is, this is how people in the kingdom of God act. This is, this is what they do, right? And then prayer and fasting. And we've talked about all these different things. Let your light so shine. All of this has not been about us. Christ has continually talked about self-centeredness. And no, our focus is on the kingdom of the God. And it's not by accident now that he gets to anxiety. How do we fight anxiety? We stop focusing on self so much. And we focus on the kingdom of God first. I think this is why third world countries do not suffer from so much like we do in the developed country. Third world country people just don't think about themselves as much as we think about ourselves. They're worried about their tribe. They're worried about their community more. So that's, that's so much what they're focused on, not us. We tend to only focus on self. And we get into bad situations. Think about Adam and Eve in the garden. At one time, they had no worries. They had no worries at all. They walked around naked. They walked in the evening with God. They got their food as God gave them their food. They tended to the garden. Life was very good. And then all of a sudden, Satan tricked them into thinking what? You do not have everything you want. Do you? You don't have everything you want. You want that thing over there, don't you? Take it. Just take it. Take it. God knows you'll be so much better off if you take it. So just take it. He doesn't want you to be like him. Just take it. When did worry enter the world? When they became self-centered. They focused on self. They saw a desire that they weren't supposed to have, but they desired it, they took it, and all of a sudden in the world now is anxiety. What did they do? They hid. They were stressed. They tried to cover their nakedness. They were worried. Very similar to us today, isn't it? So how do we fight this? Well, we see this in verses 33 through 34. It says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. For tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So first, we have to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. As I said, this has been the point of Jesus' sermon. When we're saved by his grace through faith, this means we trust in God with our whole life, with everything. Everything is fully given to him because of what Christ has done for us. And so our desire, our goal, everything in our life is what? We want to honor you, God. 
I don't want to honor Tim. I want to, I want to honor God. I want to uplift his name. I want to do what he has called me to do. And so as we talked about at the beginning, so now my life has to be different. I can't run after the things that my neighbors run after. I can't run after the things that my kids, friends, parents are running after. I was looking this morning. One of, one of those families that I, that I know because of that. They got to go to a football game at Ford Field yesterday. They got to go to a football game then at the University of Toledo. And then they went to the University of Michigan's football game, which, by the way, they beat Michigan State. Just so you guys know that. Um, they went to three football games in one day. Sounds like a good time to me. You want to know where I was? Trunk or treat? Is that trunk or treat? It's easy for me to see their life and to think, you know what, I kind of want that. Seems pretty carefree. Seems pretty fun. It seems like when you have a nicer car, you're happier. It seems like when you have a house in the right neighborhood, your life just seems to kind of fall in place. It seems like when you have that job, Everything gets easier in life. It seems like when your kids are a part of that team, things just start to open up for them. See, that's, that's chasing after the things the Gentiles chase. That's not the kingdom of God and his righteousness. As we chase the kingdom of God and his righteousness, we stop thinking about ourselves and what makes our life so easy and what's going to help me avoid suffering or what's going to help me avoid difficulty. That's not what I start to think about. What I start to think about now is, God, what is going to honor you in my life? What is it that's going to uplift and up, uphold your name above all things? God gives us a promise in the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter, six, or chapter 4, uh, verses 6 through 9. He says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then notice this, In the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What a promise. I read that at every funeral, but sadly, I'm at a lot of funerals where I know very few, if any, people in there are Christians. But I try to read them this truth, and I don't think they understand that it's in Christ that this peace is found. And so I try to explain that the best I can, but I don't think they always get it. They just want the peace. <laughs> just help me not feel bad right now that my loved one died. That's what they're really looking for. But we know that it's different. That the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What a great truth. But Paul doesn't stop there. So how do we fight anxiousness? How do we experience this peace? Paul tells us, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if, the, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. How do you fight anxiousness? Think about the things that are true. What does that mean? Word of God. The word of God is true. It's the truth that we have. Right? Whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure. I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer here, but I'm, I'm being as serious as I can. Some of you have to turn off the news. You have to turn it off. It is the exact opposite of what we're looking at here. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is noble, these things, that's not found on channel 4, channel 7, channel 2, channel 11, channel 13, whatever channel it is you follow. And it would do you some good to just turn that off. Instead of waking up and listening to the news and drinking your coffee, wake up, read the Gospel of John, and drink your coffee. Because that is true. That is truth. Now, if you're like, but I need to know what's going on, I'm fine with that. You do need to know what's going on. Don't get attached to the things that are bad. What is true in the things you're hearing? What is honorable in the things you are hearing? These are the things we lift up. These are the things that we talk about. It's easy for me to talk about this because I am the one who gets to the negative. I can see 934 people in our church parking lot, but I can see the one person who left because they didn't get the candy they wanted. And I'm mad at that person. 
Or I can see the church member who didn't pick up trash and just walked right by it. And I think, what in the world? Pick up the trash so I don't have to later. That's me. Negative. So I know what this is like. And this is something that we have to fight to do. It's something we have to pray and ask God to help us. God, help me think about the things that are true. What is lovely? What is commendable? What is pure? What is noble? God, put those things in my mind and in my heart and help me be true to them. Well, not just seeking God's kingdom, but we also, Jesus says in verse 34, is focus on today and let God handle the future. He said today has its own trouble. It's a good reminder for us as Christians that God is in control of all things and you simply are not. It doesn't mean that we are to be lazy. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 6 through 9 is still true, right? We look to the ant. Oh, you sluggard, look how they work hard. We are called to work hard. It's not bad to have a savings account. It's not bad to have a pantry with food in it. I'm not saying anything like that, no. But what the problem is, is when that becomes your treasure and you start to worry about your pantry. You start to worry about the savings account. It's starting to create anxiety. It's starting to create fear. And for most of us in this room, if we're being honest with us, it's not when the cupboards are bare. It's just when they're not completely full. We're still worried. We're still struggling. And so what Jesus is saying is, today has plenty of problems. Deal with today. We find our rest in the Lord. And we can rest at night because we know that he is the Lord and God of tomorrow. And the day after and the day after and whatever it may bring. And we'll deal with it as it comes. But then lastly, in fighting anxiousness, we have to remember that God loves us. We talked about this already, but I really do want you to know and hold on to the fact that God loves you. The world might tell you different. Your brain might tell you different. But the truth is, God's word says he loves you. Satan loves to make the children of God think that God really doesn't care about them. Don't let him trick you into that. Yes, you might be facing difficulty, but life will have difficulty. I think so many children today are diagnosed with anxiety because they're kind of being taught that if you have any struggle in life, that's something bad. That's just not true. Life is a struggle. The Bible tells us that. We know we're going to face these difficulties, but we do them and face them in an honoring way to God. Well, lastly, because I know this is going long. What is Jesus' words to those of us who struggle with anxiousness today? Well, the first thing I want you to know is this. All anxiety and worry is not sinful. I don't think that's what this passage is teaching. You say, well, Pastor Tim, what are you talking about? Well, if you look at Jesus in the garden, he was so stressed that he was sweating drops of blood. But he never lacked faith in the moment. He never lacked trust in God, and he was willing to obey God even though it was leading to something that was going to be excruciating and difficult. That's the difference. He didn't just push that hurt aside. No, he, he walked in it faithfully because this is what God had called him to. So I don't want you to sit here today and necessarily think that just because you have some worry this week, oh, I'm instantly sinning. I don't, I don't really think that's the case. And here's what Jesus does for those of us who worry. He calls to us, and what does he say? He says, come near. In Matthew chapter 8 and 9, which isn't a part of this series, Jesus goes on to deal with a huge list of people and their problems and their worries and their anxieties. He finds people with terminal illnesses. He finds people who've had loved ones die. People facing physical discomfort and sickness, spiritual oppression, financial security, physical safety, spiritual warfare. There's people who have a loss of their reputation. People whose children are suffering. There's people who are permanently disabled. And with every single one of them, Jesus goes up to them. And what does he do? He tells them to draw near to them. He shows them his love and his care for them. Now for each of these people, he doesn't take their anxiety away. He doesn't take their pain away. No, but he continually points them to the one who they need to put their trust in so that they will not fear anymore. And that's God. I don't know what you're going through this morning, but Jesus tells you this morning as you suffer with your anxiety, come to me. 
come to me. I read this all the time. Maybe you're sick of hearing it. I almost feel like it needs to be put up on our doors. Matthew 11, come to me, Jesus says, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Anxiety is real, and I know that this morning. And you might just be crippled with the fear of anxiety or whatever, whatever might be going on. Jesus doesn't look at you and say, deal with it. That's what I would do. (laughs) I would look at you and say, deal with it. Suck it up. Let's go. Jesus looks at you this morning and he says, come here. Come to me. I can give you rest from this. Look to me. My yoke, it's it's easy. This burden that I have is light. Why? Because I've, I've done it all for you. He reminds you this morning that you are a child of God and he loves you and he cares for you and he doesn't want you to worry. You can love your own child. How much more can God love you? He loves you. Does that mean life's going to be easy and a piece of cake? No. But he's never going to leave you. And on the day when you die, you will be with him. No more pain, no more hurt, no more crying, no more suffering. None of that will be a part of your life anymore. You will be with him forever. And we know that as believers, and so we live our life different than the Gentiles. We don't seek after the things they're seeking after. No. We seek after the kingdom of God, and we do it. Looking to the things that are true, that are noble, that are pure, that are righteous, that are excellent. These are the things we focus on that we think about. Why? So we praise God in his name. And we're light in a dark world, drawing others to us. Who in the world would want to come to Monroe Missionary Baptist Church if all we are is a bunch of stressed out, anxiety-ridden people? Nobody. Because I can go anywhere else for that. But who would want to come to Monroe Missionary Baptist Church if what we think about is the truth? What is honorable in this world? What is pure? What is right? What is excellent? If we're people of kindness and righteousness and holiness, I think a lot of people would want to come here. I think it would draw a lot of people. And we can point them to the God that saved us. Let's bow together this morning in prayer for your time to respond to the word of God. I hope that you will do that today. God, we thank you for your word. God, I thank you for the truth of your word. God, you know that we all struggle with this worry. Some more than others, yes, but we all have difficulties with it. God, help us in our life. Help us to look to you. God, for some this morning, they, they need real healing from worry and struggle. They're scared of maybe where the future is headed. They're, they're scared for their children or their grandchildren. They're, they're nervous about a lot of different things. God, I pray that you would help them. I pray that they would experience the peace that Paul wrote about in Philippians chapter 4. I pray that this morning they would feel the loving embrace of Jesus, their Savior, who says, come to me. I will give you rest. God, we won't find that in this world. We only find that here in Christ. And so God, help us this morning to experience that peace, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and sing, and then we'll be dismissed. was lost in darkest night you thought I knew the way the sin that promised joy in life had led me to the grave I had no hope that you would own a rebel to If you had not loved me first, I would refuse you still. But as I ran my hell-bound race, indifferent.
different to the cost you looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross and I beheld God's love displayed you suffered in my place you bore the wrath Reserved for me, now all I know is grace. Hallelujah. All I have is Christ. Hallelujah. Jesus is. strength to follow your commands could never come from me. Oh, Father, use my ransom life in any way you choose, and let my song forever be my only I do want you to know this morning that if you're somebody who struggles with this, you struggle with anxiety, I, I'm praying for you. I, uh, I know the difficulty that anxiety can lead to somebody's life or even to a, a family. I don't want you to think I'm standing up here without any knowledge of this. Our youngest daughter that we adopted destroyed by anxiety. She was born with fetal alcohol syndrome, born addicted to drugs, and born early. It changes our whole family's life, and she can't help it. She can't help it. I can't look at her and say, trust Jesus. She doesn't, she doesn't get that. And I know that some of you struggle with that too. I'm praying for you. I'm praying that Christ, as I said, would embrace you. That you would experience peace in your life. And that he would help you with it. Let's bow together. Let's pray. Be dismissed. God, I thank you for your promises. I thank you for your truth. Even in the difficulty of life, we can have joy. We can have peace because we know who we are in you, what you have given us, what you have, what you have done for us through the blood of our Savior. And God, we do look forward to the promise of when Christ will return, when all this will be, will be done, when the race will be over, when Christ will reign on the throne over all the nations forever and ever and ever. God, we do long for that day. But God, until that day, we know that you give us many good days here. You give us many good gifts, many good things. You are a Father who loves us. And if you love the birds of the air, if you love the lilies of the field, and you water them, and you feed them, and you take care of them, how much more do you care for us? And God, the answer is so much more. So God, I pray that this week we would we would realize and see how much you love us, that we'd be reminded of that. God, help us as a church to love each other well, to be there for one another through the thick and the thin, 
through difficulties. God, guide us and lead us to be light in a dark world. I pray for our students as they go to school this week, that they would be light in their hallways. I pray for those who are going to go to work, that they would be light in the workplaces. I pray that as we're at home, we are light to our children. Because God, we do, we do want to honor you. But God, again, also, I hope that this week we would remember what you've said to us, that in you we find rest. Help us to be well-rested in Christ each and every day, holding on to his truths, fighting for the faith day in and day out. God, we love you. We thank you that you care for us. We thank you that we've, you've sent Jesus, and we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. God bless.